Hey, uh, thanks so much uh, for the opportunity to speak here today. I'm really grateful for the invitation from the organizers of this conference. Um, as you'll hear, the, the talk is about type 1 diabetes, which has been the focus of my professional life. Um, these are my disclosures. I'm the medical director for McNair Interest, which is a private equity group, which is investing in type 1 diabetes and other chronic illnesses. I'm also a consultant for Sanofi and Lexicon, and I consume a low carbohydrate uh, diet and I'm in nutritional ketosis. I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, type 1 diabetes. Millions of people have type 1 diabetes around the world. It's a really serious problem. Injected insulin is the only available therapy, and there's a very high burden of illness. It's challenging to keep blood sugars in normal range. There's a risk of excessive weight gain and hypoglycemia with increased insulin. Um, and frequent hypoglycemia uh, in people who live with type 1 is quite debilitating, um, with one to two episodes per week in some or dozens in others. And there's a major risk of life-threatening complications, uh, and this includes cardiovascular disease and, and other very serious complications, potentially treatable uh, and preventable with tight control. We'll talk more about this. And definitive therapies, I, I hesitate to even use the word, but I'll say it here, cures are really a long ways off. And uh, people who live with type 1 diabetes often describe that their friends or relatives say, hey, what about this or what about that? But people who've lived with type 1 diabetes a long time will tell you that they've been forwarded news stories and anecdotes for decades and decades, and they're still waiting. So I'm here to talk about some strategies to help the people who live with type 1 diabetes now. And I have to start with the diabetes control complication trial. And if you want to know anything about type 1 diabetes, you have to start with this trial we call the DCCT. It's essential. And it's 1,441 patients with type 1 diabetes of only a few years duration. And they trialed intensive therapy versus conventional therapy for a total of seven years. And you can see this massive difference in one of the primary outcomes. This is diabetic retinopathy. Um, decreased retinopathy was massive, uh, massively improved in this population that had tight control. And at the time, most people had a glycated hemoglobin. This is the precursor to hemoglobin A1C of around 9%. But in the intensive arm, they were able to get them down to around 7%. And they did this by a variety of means. Uh, including what we now call heavy touch, a lot of support, a, a, a lot of uh, thoughtful health care. But what are the outcomes in typically treated type 1 diabetes? Unfortunately, they're not great. And so, sadly, most people with type 1 diabetes fail to achieve the glycemic targets. We'd like people to be under 7% who are adults, but sadly, as you can see here from this graph from the T1D exchange, the vast majority of, uh, of children and adolescents are well above that, and the average hemoglobin A1C for adults was 7.5%. And moreover, contrast this data with more recent data, and you can see that things are getting worse, not better. So despite our awareness that there's a lot of unmet need in type 1 diabetes, we're just not moving the needle. It's getting worse. Shocking. So sadly, there's also excess cardiovascular death in typically treated type 1 diabetes. This is a new article from the New England Journal of Medicine. It describes a cohort from Sweden. And what you see is that in a person who has a hemoglobin A1C of 7.9 to 8.7%, there's an increased risk of death from any cause that's 3.11 fold the baseline population. And cardiovascular death has increased 4.4 fold, and there's a dose dependent increase beyond that. And I can tell you, we have plenty of patients who never get their hemoglobin A1Cs below 10. So it's terrifying, and it illustrates that we as a society are failing to adequately serve these people. So why is it so hard to effectively treat type 1 with insulin? It should be pretty easy, right? So it's an autoimmune condition, they don't make insulin because the T cells and uh, attack the pancreas. They lose the ability to make insulin. You should be able to replace it, right? It's just not so simple. As it turns out, it's a, it's a strange hormone uh, to replace. I'm going to get into that. But another problem relates to the, the diet. 
And so this is a very typical chart from a, from a large children's hospital, and it describes children from a range of ages, and it makes suggestions about the recommended carbohydrate amount per age of child. And you can see that if you had a, uh, a boy in between nine and 13 years of age, that, you would, you, that you're asked to, to feed this boy 60 grams of carbohydrates for breakfast, 75 grams for lunch, 15 for a snack, 75 for dinner, and an evening snack of 15 grams. And so where does this come from? This comes from the AMDR. I don't have time to get into this. If you're interested, go to the YouTube video from last year's talk. But as it turns out, the Institute of Medicine prescribes uh, these, these amounts of macronutrients, and our dietitians in major children's hospitals around the country follow them uh, with very, little, very few exceptions. And so that's 45 to 65% uh, uh, carbohydrates in your, in your macronutrients and 25 to 35% fat. So what does that actually look like? Well, in a person who lives with type 1 diabetes, they would, um, of course, have to take some basal insulin. That's the amount of insulin that they need just to keep going to, 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 to ensure that they're not breaking down fat. They need some basal insulin dripping in their bodies. They would take a very long-acting form of insulin or have a pump that would do this. And then they would wake up in the morning. This boy would consume 60 grams of carbohydrates, get a couple of units of insulin, and then 75 grams, and then 105 grams. And then the hope is that blood glucose would stay in a steady range, and everything would be nice and smooth. Um, and uh, many endocrinologists believe that it will work if you simply follow uh, our prescriptions. So they think that the major limitation in between these ideal blood sugars and outcomes is simply a patient's ability to follow very precisely the instructions from the medical team. Um, I'm here to tell you that it's much more complicated than that. And sadly, a much more likely scenario is that people have these wild excursions with huge uh, ups and downs in blood sugars, these sine waves. And you can imagine what it's like to have a blood sugar of 350 and be on the downward slope of a roller coaster and wondering if you're gonna actually crash down into the ground. And that tear just completely disrupts some people's lives. And so I'm going to show you some actual uh, patient data that describes this. So this is data from a continuous glucose monitor. It happens to be the Dexcom, but there are several brands on the market. And what we're doing here is actually um, looking at the interstitial glucose, not blood glucose, but it's roughly the same thing, of an 18-year-old who's had type 1 diabetes for more than 10 years. And this is a high-carb day. And you can see that this person is rising up and down with a ton of volatility. And just again, imagine yourself around seven o'clock wondering if you're gonna crash out. And by the way, if blood glucose goes below 50 or 40 milligrams per deciliter, they could go unconscious. So it strikes a lot of terror in the people who live with type one. And you can also see the rebound hyperglycemia afterwards. So that's reflected in the standard deviation, not just in the average blood glucose. This person is sitting with an average glucose of around 200, but the standard deviation is 90. So a lot of volatility, a lot of flux, a lot of variance. And the time and range is relatively low. 40% of this day is spent out of the ideal range. Okay, are there innovative dietary uh, interventions for type 1 diabetes? And thankfully the answer is yes. So, in short, eat more protein and fat. It's just that simple. Um, and it makes an enormous difference. And so I, I described the Institute of Medicine, the so-called AMDR, the Acceptable Macronutrient Distribution Range of uh, a very high percentage of carbohydrates with some protein and some fat. But the obvious answer is to simply swap this out with a more logical regimen. If carbohydrate is the macronutrient that you can't effectively metabolize or cover with insulin, eat less. So what am I talking about? It, so it's a, in this case, this would be a low-carb, high-protein diet, which would have a bunch of protein and a bunch of fat. And um, this is what happens if you eat, for instance, a, a ribeye steak and some vegetables on the side. Um, another alternative is to actually go 
to a, a low-carb, high-fat diet, and there are um, others who deliberately pursued this with an, a semi-normal amount of protein, maybe a little bit more, and a lot of fat. And we'll talk about some of the nuances of this. I call this, this is low-carb, high-fat, or nutritional ketosis. So what does this look like? Well, you're still going to need your basal insulin. That's not going to change. But you might consume 20 grams of protein, a couple of eggs in the morning, and have a very small bolus, and then 25 grams in the middle of the day, and then 35 grams in the evening. So this would be this 10-year-old child I talked about before, and ideally blood sugars would sit in a very normal range throughout the day. And um, if that were true, that'd be very exciting. And then presumably you'd be able to have blood sugars that again are in the normal range for a lot of the day, thus reducing the variability and al allowing people to just breathe and feel like, they, like they're more human. Um, so I showed you this tracing of the 18-year-old who's had type 1 diabetes for 10 years and all the volatility. Let's look at the same person on a low-carb day. It's just, it's just a dramatic difference. And, And being able to predict where you're going to be means that, um, you know, the, the math test that you have in the afternoon or the job interview or the date that you have in the evening or a drive down the highway isn't associated with terror and anxiety, but it can, be, can allow you to simply live life. Um, I showed you a 20, I want to show you a 23-year-old with type 1 diabetes for 12 years on a high-carb day. Um, this person has a lot of volatility, as you can see, ups and downs. Um, and this is the same person on a low-carb day. So an immense difference uh, with, you see, a standard deviation of only 23 milligrams per deciliter. And here's a 22-year-old who's had type 1 diabetes for one year. And you can see this person has been on low-carb since diagnosis and flat blood sugars very little variation, presumably because the ability to make insulin has somehow been preserved. And that's very curious. Am I saying that low carb could actually preserve the ability to make insulin if it were, if it were supported at the point of diagnosis? I don't know. I, I don't really know. We need good clinical trials. I'd like to see NIH TrialNet carry out proper randomized clinical trials on newly diagnosed people to see if we can prolong the so-called honeymoon of production of insulin and how long we could do that. But I look at examples like this and I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just electrified. So it might be possible. Okay, there is this paper that's been mentioned at this conference several times. It's wonderful. Belinda Len Leonard, who's here, who's going to be um, presenting later on tonight, um, is the first author, and Dr. David Ludwig is the senior author in this paper. And this is a group of people who follow a low-carb diet. They're members of a Facebook group called Type 1 Grit. They are followers of Dr. Richard Bernstein. And this group of people have um, reported mean hemoglobin A1C of 5.67%. Wow. So most people are in normal range. And so finally now we have the data that, low, that, that people who live with type 1 can have really outstanding control. And that is so exciting. Um, and again, I mentioned type 1 grit, all one word. This is a Facebook group comprised of followers of Dr. Richard Bernstein. Uh, it was founded by, by Artie Dykeman. It's an incredibly supportive place where people learn how to do this and, and to help each other. So would low-carbohydrate nutrition violate consensus guidelines? Well, mm, maybe not. So this is from the 2019 Standards of Medical Care in Diabetes, just published this past January. And here's the statement. Studies examining the ideal amount of carbohydrate intake for people with diabetes are inconclusive. <laughs> what that means is there's wiggle room for us to experiment. <laughs> there is a statement afterwards that says, oh, though monitoring carbohydrate intake and considering blood glucose are key uh, in, for improving postprandial glucose control. But again, it says it's inconclusive. So there's a, a lack of precision, and we should take that and run with it. Similarly, fat. The ideal amount of dietary fat for individuals with diabetes is controversial. 
So they're giving us room about the amount of dietary fat. They're not uh, providing what I would call false precision. Um, they go on to quote the Institute of Medicine, now we're renamed the National Academy of Medicine, with their macronutrient distribution ratios, but they do not prescribe these macronutrient distribution ratios for people who live with diabetes. And so it's important to take this next paragraph in context. And they say, evidence suggests that there's not an ideal percentage of calories from, car from carbohydrate, protein, and fat for all people with diabetes. Okay, there we go. Um, therefore, it should be assessed and individualized. To my mind, that means that people who have type 1, who wish to pursue a low-carbohydrate approach, must be supported by their healthcare teams. Just that simple. Consider personal preference. It says so right there. Okay, and they say uh, providers must maintain some insight. They also specifically uh, preclude the use of low-carbohydrate nutrition in, in children, and I'm not so certain that there's any real evidence for this. And, but, and they say that there's inadequate research on dietary patterns for type 1 diabetes to support one eating plan over another. So again, leaving us room to, 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 uh, to experiment. So how about these low-carb strategies for people with type 1? I want to provide with you very quickly a series of vignettes uh, and some tips and also some dangers. So adjust insulin doses for glycemic load. This seems obvious, but it must be done. So if, for instance, a typical dose a regimen over the course of the day looks like this with 60 grams in the morning and 75 grams of carbs at lunch and 105 at dinner, and you're taking this amount of insulin, well, you can't take the same amount of insulin if you're, if you're consuming less carbs. This is obvious to anybody who lives with type 1 diabetes, uh, but it has been asserted as a potential source of danger because people would, quote, take the same dose of insulin and then go low. So. Um, if you were to consume 20 grams of protein and you took the same dose of insulin and then 25 and, and then you went on to take 35 grams. So this very low carb day with just a bunch of protein, well, what would happen, of course, is you would go low and your blood sugars would crash and then they would then they'd go high and low. And the reason is you'd have to use carbs to rescue yourself and then you'd be wondering why that low carb thing has been claimed to be so good. But again, you have to adjust insulin for the amount of carbohydrate. It's a very simple idea. Um, if you do that, presumably you're going to end up with small doses of insulin. You're going to end up with um, a, a ultimately very simple blood sugars that are flat and in the normal range. Okay. Well, use continuous glucose monitoring. I think this is important. For those who can't afford it, it's, it's essential to test all the time. And the Freestyle Libre is at least somewhat affordable. The Dexcom, I know, is, is quite expensive, and there are some people who are self-insured for whom the, the cost is prohibitive. But um, certainly you could test often if you couldn't afford CGM, and you could even test urine and do 24-hour urines to figure out how much glucose is spilling in urine. But essentially, you, you don't know your glucose flux. Um, well, then you, you, you can't intervene to improve it. And so if you're not checking all the time or you're not following CGM, you don't see your glucose variance, it's going to be very confusing. And you might have this hidden variation um, in your blood sugars throughout the day, and you simply wouldn't know it. And there are blood sugars that can go up and down in ways you can't even imagine. For instance, highs only in the evening. And so, again, you could have blood sugars that are very, very smooth, but you'd have to test all the time to really figure this out and to go through the process of learning, heuristic learning, self-learning. So another one, treat protein with insulin. This is essential. This is a core component of Dr. Bernstein's approach. And uh, if you consume 20 grams of protein and you em omit your insulin bolus, you say, I'm not eating any carbs. I'm just going to eat the protein. I should be okay. What happens is your blood sugar will rise and rise and rise. You're going to wonder why this low-carb thing has been claimed to be so good, and it's really quite frustrating. So the obvious answer is for these doses of protein, figure out a small extended bolus of insulin for each one of them. For 10 grams of protein, it's about 6 grams of carbohydrates but it's delayed over several hours. So you should expect that these are carbs that will last many more hours 
the protein will, in, in effect, act like carbohydrates, and you're going to need to use an extended bolus. So again, 10 grams of protein, 6 grams of slow carbs. Um, Use slow-acting carbs to counteract exercise-associated hypoglycemia. This is a very serious issue for people who live with type 1 diabetes. If they're, if they're exercising and, and, and they happen to, to, to have uh, uh, highs and, and, and low blood sugars, it can be a really serious problem. And essentially what's happening is in the midst of exercise, you have a rush of adrenaline and, and your blood sugars can go up. And then afterwards, you get exercise associated insulin-independent glucose uptake in skeletal muscle, and you can go low, and then often people will have to have rescue carbs, and then they consume too many, and then they go high. So this is a serious problem. But one way to counteract that is to use something like protein, say, for instance, peanut butter, or alternatively, super starch, or there's a product called UCAN, and this is essentially polymerized cornstarch that's that much bigger, it takes that much more time to digest. And this is one of these, your results may vary. It's going to require a bit of, of uh, back and forth to figure out the right dose of carbohydrate and the right, right amount of timing in order to counteract exercise-associated hypoglycemia. OK, another one. Get over your fat phobia. And the reason is you're going to have to consume dietary fat in significant amounts in order to get enough calories when you begin to reduce the carbohydrates. And so this is a very typical meal for somebody who's on a low carb approach. This is a, at my friend uh, Marshall's house. I had lunch with him. He was serving a low carb bread and he had a homemade uh, aioli that was made with avocado oil and he had smoked some salmon and we also had uh, some, some avocado. But as you can see from this meal, most of it is fat and protein. And unless you're able to consume enough fat, you're going to be starving all the time. So don't just make it about omission of carbohydrates. Actively consume more fat. It's important. OK. Carbohydrate intolerance may accompany nutritional ketosis. Some people consume so little carbohydrate and so little protein that they're able to get routinely into nutritional ketosis. Uh, as Dr. Finney says, a well-formulated ketogenic diet. And, um, and, and for these folks, um, it can be a, a real problem. I'm going to show you what, what I'm talking about. On a standard American diet, a person with type 1 diabetes may have an insulin to carb ratio that allows them a, very a seemingly precise relationship between carbs and insulin. Of course, it doesn't always work this way, but this is the ideal. But as you switch to, for instance, nutritional ketosis, you may discover that carbohydrates will simply throw your blood sugars out of whack. And I think what's happening is the metabolic machinery in the body has switched from carb burning to fat burning. And what's happening now is these, these people are exposed to so few carbohydrates that when they do, their blood sugars rise quite up. And I hear over and over again in people who are in nutritional ketosis that they require very little carbohydrate to, for instance, rescue a low blood sugar. So think about this, be aware of it. Um, and it may be frustrating, by the way, because if you try to oscillate in between low carb and standard American diet, you may wonder why your blood sugars are simply zany on the high carb days. Okay, consider MUFAs to, to reduce LDL. I don't really have time to talk about the whole paradox of elevated uh, uh, LDL cholesterol and lipids in type 1 diabetes, but let's just say that we know um, that, that people with type 1 diabetes are at risk for uh, very high LDL. We don't really know what that means, but we also know that in general, people with type 1 diabetes have high cardiovascular risk. For some reason, a lot of young athletic people who I've interacted with who have type 1 diabetes end up with high LDLs. And maybe it's that they're the so-called lean mass hyper responders, as, as Dave Feldman has, has so nicely described, or maybe it's something unique to the, to the um, state of type 1 diabetes. But I'd like to suggest that there might be ways around this. So if your LDL is very high and you are concerned, you should know that there are other ways to get more fat in your body. And uh, my friend uh, and colleague uh, and mentor, Carrie Dioulis, is a person who lives with type 1. She's, she's on Instagram. And, and she also is a member of something called Vegan Keto Made Simple, which is a Facebook group. And she eats very colorful foods 
that have a lot of monounsaturated fatty acids, uh, very few carbohydrates. She's routinely in nutritional ketosis, uh, and she's simply, um, uh, and she has a very low LDL, and she's found that um, this is one way around it. Now, do I know per se that that's the cause? No, but there are anecdotal reports that more monounsaturated fatty acids might be beneficial. Okay, these are the kinds of foods that she'll eat. Consider automated insulin delivery pumps with low carb. And um, I would just say that this is a tandem T-Slim. It has predictive low glucose to spin. And the cool thing here is that if your blood sugar is low and going lower, the thing stops infusing insulin. So that vertical red stripe is the amount of time that the insulin stops infusing insulin. It's so cool. And so this is available now. It's FDA approved. It's available in the United States and it's coming around the world. And it's incredibly beneficial. Uh, and it might be synergistic with low carb because if you don't have these huge excursions up and the thing knows to stop infusing insulin when you're going low, very, very exciting. And as you can see, in some cases, it, the thing will shut off for half the night but you'll still have very, very tight blood sugars. So um, just quickly, I'd like to suggest that people with type 1 diabetes should plan a low-carb weekend. And so if your blood sugars are normally doing this on the standard American diet from Friday into Monday, beforehand, before the weekend occurs, plan out a low-carb weekend, figure out what it is, and then see how you feel. Try to determine if a low-carb low nutrition might have value for you. And, and listen to yourself. So watch out for euglycemic DKA. This is a big, big deal. So we haven't seen that many cases of it, but I think it'll be more common. And essentially, the problem is, if you wake up with nausea and you feel awful, and the reason is your insulin catheter fell out in the middle of the night and, and you're in trouble, you normally would look at your blood sugar and you'd find your blood glucose to be elevated. And that would tell you that you have a problem with insulin infusion. So Blood glucose is the primary biomarker of life-threatening insulin deficiency. But if you're in nutritional ketosis or you've been fasting a long time, um, you may not be aware of that. And the reason is you could have very little carbohydrate in your intestine. So your blood glucose may not rise as fast. And again, blood glucose is the primary biomarker of life-threatening insulin deficiency for people with type 1. So we're seeing and, and hearing anecdotes about what I call euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. There's a lot of talk about this. And uh, of course, the answer is to test for ketones. Ketone testing is essential. And I think you'll discover that beta-hydroxybutyrate is elevated if you're, in a, if you're in a dangerous situation. So there are ways to test for ketones. This is, this is, this is one vendor. Um, and it's important to then test for ketones and ultimately contact your healthcare team, consume carbohydrate and, and lots of liquids until you feel better. Again, glucose may not be a reliable biomarker for life-threatening insulin deficiency when in nutritional ketosis. And uh, there's, this is another vendor. This is the Precision Extra. And I just want to point out that strips can be had for 78 cents a piece. So there are plenty of options to test for ketones. For type 1. For, yeah. yeah, and insurance may, um, should cover it. Doesn't always. Um, this is a consensus statement that came out recently that I had the pleasure of participating in. This is about these new drugs, these SGLT inhibitors, and they are also associated with euglycemic DKA. And I would read this consensus statement. You want to understand this issue. It's very complicated, but it's, it's, it's worth at least considering. Beware of hypoglycemic unawareness. So this is a big deal. If your beta-hydroxybutyrate is always high and your blood glucose um, is is, uh, drops into a low range, you may be unaware that you're low. And so that would be very scary. And I've, I've had patients call me and tell me that they were, had low blood glucose and they didn't realize it. So CGM may be essential to detect cryptic hypoglycemia within people with type 1 diabetes who are in nutritional ketosis. If you're in hardcore keto, you probably also need to be in CGM because you will not be aware of every low, low blood glucose. I think it's going to be a component of, of, of nutritional ketosis. Okay, so I'm almost done. Just a few more tips. Uh, focus on compassion. So type 1 diabetes is really hard. So listen to your body, listen to your mind, take your time. Um, this is tough stuff to learn, and, and you need to really try to um, give yourself the time and energy to, to, to focus on it. Practice self-compassion. So be kind to self even when things don't go well, because it's a, it's a long road and it takes a lot of work. 
Um, celebrate small successes, extend love to those around you, and um, find someone else to support in their journey for type 1 diabetes. Giving back is a really big deal. So I have some resources briefly, Dr. Bernstein's book I mentioned, also uh, this, this paper, uh, which again, uh, Belinda Leonard's paper and type 1 grit. I, Adam Brown's book is terrific. Be, be, be sure to check it out. Um, there's also uh, Jessica Turton's uh, uh, systematic review on low carb and type 1, which is in PLOS One, and then also these acknowledgments. And then finally, I, I just want to dedicate this talk to the people who live with type 1 and ultimately uh, and to their journey, because ultimately for them, it's really quite lonely. And um, they are learning and growing. And what I found over and over again is they benefit immensely from each other. And uh, as we together move forward, it's easy to concentrate on technology or nutrition or other things around the disease, but ultimately it's about compassion. It's about building community because from that we'll be able to change the paradigm. And so I often think, you know, I'm, I'm a big music fan. I often think about this in the context of, of pop music. One of my favorite songs is, is this song by George Harrison, Isn't It a Pity? And I imagine this uh, from one person with type 1 diabetes speaking it to the global community. So some things take so long, but how do I explain when not too many people can see we're all the same? Um, and because of all their tears, your eyes can't hope to see the beauty that surrounds them now. Isn't it a pity? So there we go.